Welcome to the Advance Your Art podcast, where we talk about the journey from artist to entrepreneur and everything in between. You've worked hard to hone your craft. Now take it to the next level with tips, techniques, strategies, and routines used by successful artists to grow their businesses and careers. Now, let's get started and have some fun with your host, Yuri Cataldo. Bill, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm terrific, Gary. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for asking. Sure. I'd like to start off by asking how you describe yourself and what it is that you do. Well, my wife gives me a hard time about this because she thinks I undersell myself. So I'm going to try the best I can <laughs> to be able to do this. I am a sales trainer by trade. And my emphasis, my, my specialty is working with the ticket sales departments of professional sports teams. Uh, I've been fortunate enough now to work with over 100 different teams from the majors to the minors mm -hmm. uh, all throughout North America, including Mexico and, and, uh, and Canada. Uh, soon, within the next year or two, to be working overseas as well. Uh, there is a, a methodology that I've created to help sports sales teams increase their ticket sales mm -hmm. and the way in which they provide customer service. And so that's my work. And uh, it takes me to all four corners of the U.S. and beyond. Wow, that's, uh, that sounds really exciting. Have you always been excited and interested in, in sales and particularly working with professional sports teams? You know, the, the sports thing really kind of came as an afterthought. I was really, as, as a, a young guy, I really wanted to be a radio star. Okay. And that was my thing. In fact, at 16, I became the youngest licensed radio broadcaster in the state of Illinois uh, at a time where you had to have a third-class radio operator's license to be on the air, which is not true today. Right. Uh, but a bunch of my friends, they just got their driver's license. We all went up to the Dirksen Federal Building in Chicago because I live about an hour south of there. Mm -hmm. We took the test, we all passed, and I was the only one to ever use the te the actual piece of paper. Uh, but it had to be displayed in the window of the radio station in which you worked. And so in order to have that job, you had to have a piece of paper. So uh, I was able to, to find a job here locally at our 50,000-watt rock and roll FM station at the age of 16. And in fact, was doing morning drive uh, fill-in at 18, which is unheard of in broadcast terms. And so... I was having a great time in radio and, and, you know, still living at home. I was still doing school back and forth. And, and it was just fantastic. Well, at 21, I figured out where the money was and it wasn't on the air. It was <laughs> in the sales department. Oh, sure. Uh, that broadcast jobs really were paying minimum wage. What they really wanted was somebody who didn't really speak all that well. That was not the number one qualification. The number one qualification was, could we trust you to show up on time? Because the midnight guy yeah. who had just gotten off a six-hour shift at 6 a.m. was ready to go home. Mm -hmm. And if the guy didn't show up at 6 o'clock, well, he was now 6.30, 6.40. You were there until the other guy arrived. And they had had a challenge finding people that were uh, – you know, who really could just be dependable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I was fortunate to not only be dependable, but I had a, a pretty decent voice, and it worked out pretty well. But at 21, I really figured out – I needed to be in sales. I was an entrepreneur by nature. I actually had a t-shirt business at the campus of my college because there was no uh, sports store that would do intramural jerseys. And so I literally went into the business of sports and t-shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kept me in beer money and uh, a little extra because uh, that's important, right, Yuri? You got to have beer money. Of course, especially in college. Very important. So uh, once I graduated, I really kind of got the bug. I did uh, on-air stuff. And so really at, at 21 when I graduated – there were no on-air positions available at my local station. And so they offered me a sales position okay. uh, that paid $120 a week. And my job was to drive up to the suburbs near Chicago in places that we had never sold advertising and try and kind of shake the trees and, and see what was there because we had really just stayed within the borders of our county until I arrived. And so you know, I was driving, you know, 30 miles north a day and mm -hmm. just trying to you know, drum up business wherever I could for the rock and roll station we had. And, uh, and within seven months, I was billing 30% of the radio station's total. 
Wow. Uh, now, there was a little luck in there, but man, I worked my tail off and I was given the chance. And so little did I know that because of what I had uncovered up in the suburbs, uh, the station sold for a considerably more, uh, a larger sum of money than would have otherwise. And so new owners came in in March mm -hmm. uh, and did lots of different things. And, and uh, uh, so it, it was, uh, I got a slap on the back at the Christmas party from the owner and said, hey, great job, kid, keep up the great work. And I had no idea who he was, <laughs> what he did. <laughs> Uh, but apparently I had done some good things and it worked out well. So the, the bottom line was I, I stayed 25 years in broadcast media, had a great time, learned a lot, became sales manager, in fact, part owner of a station for a time. And about 12 years ago, I realized that there was something turning, something different was happening. Okay. Uh, satellite radio was becoming a little more prevalent. The iPod was really gaining popularity. For So if you really wanted your own music, you didn't have to listen to the radio any longer. Mm. And I felt like radio was getting less relevant. And so I, I got the bug to be a published author and a speaker. And so I started doing these kind of side gigs at chambers of commerce and they'd say, hey, can you speak on customer service? I said, sure, I can speak on customer service. Can you speak on team building? Yeah, I can do team building. And so you, I became this like generalist mm -hmm. um, until 10 years ago, uh, I was well, actually doing a, a, a session at a suburban chamber of commerce uh, prior to the US Open coming. It was actually uh, in Matson, Illinois, prior to the Olympia Fields uh, uh, US Open. Okay. And a uh, gentleman came up in the back of the room, had a White Sox jacket on. And uh, I said, well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, fans coming up to say hi. Well, he'd stayed there the whole time. And, and he came up and he introduced himself. His name was Tom Sheridan. And he was the director of ticket sales for the White Sox. Hmm. And he said, Bill, he says, we could really use a guy that's got your energy in this ticket sales thing. You know, there are a few people that actually go around and train the ticket sales department of sports teams. You ought to talk to me. And so he gives me his card. And my mind is blown. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What a cool thing that would be. And so yeah. to make a long story short, the very first job I had was with the sister team to the White Sox, which is the Chicago Bulls. Okay. Very first team I had a chance to work with because the two of them knew each other and they had talked about Tom seeing me. And bottom line is I've now had the good fortune to work with uh, your friends at the Red Sox. Uh, and over 100 different teams, uh, ranging from the very smallest minor league clubs all the way up uh, to the very most storied franchises in professional sports today. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's absolutely amazing. Uh, so I'm I'm curious if you could unpack some of those. So your early days back at the radio station when you were just starting off in sales. I actually, before I, in between a couple of jobs I did, I worked uh, for a, a local TV station and mm -hmm. had a, a similar experience where they just kind of handed, they'll, actually they handed me a phone book and they said, we need more more business, so go and find something. In, I'm curious, in when you first started off, how did you find leads? Were there certain things you would say to, to people to get them you know, on board? Were there certain books you were reading about sales structure? How did you learn sales? Sure. Tom Hopkins, who is a, a legend in our business, is really one of the guys that I read first. Uh, at the time, there were not a lot of business authors doing sales books. And so there, the few of them that were there were very popular. Zig Ziglar was a big guy at the time and, and Hopkins. And then uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Chris Lytle, who was working in the radio industry, who had several uh, things that he had written. And then we had our radio trade publication, which was very good, Radio Inc., that helped me define who I would be on the street and the kinds of words I might say. I had terrific training from Kathy Galliano, who was my very first sales manager and still is at that station that I worked at the time. <laughs> uh, so it, it uh, I had a lot of good foundational okay. training, but I think some of it really comes from within mm -hmm. uh, to be able to come into a business and, and have the words to say is one thing, but to have the personality to have the words to kind of the, the, whatever behind the words are to pull it off is really something that, that's required. I had two things going for me at the time. One, I just had this insane desire to learn about people mm -hmm. and businesses and, and the things that they were doing. And so I, I really kind of, when I would go into a business cold, which I did often, uh, I would just be kind of curious about what they did. And so I think that curiosity helped me. Uh, create some sort of a bond with those people who were in charge and, 
and I would be literally legitimately asking questions. I wouldn't be just going and doing it because it was my job. Right. I really wanted to know. And I think that sincerity came through. Sure. And I think the second part is the ability to listen, to listen to what others say and to what their words mean behind what they're actually saying. Business owners, as you found out in television, mm -hmm. are not necessarily the most forward in giving you information that you need to figure out what to use to do with them. So right. it was important for me to understand what they were saying, not the words that they were saying, but the tone and what their inference might mean in that. And so I think I learned early on that I needed to be a great listener and just a very curious individual. And those two things really paid off well for me. And, and I think... People that saw me, they, they saw my sincerity uh, and, uh, and decided to invest in the station. Some of them who had never heard the station before. Uh, my very first sale mm -hmm. was to an outfit in Chicago Heights, Illinois, called Seaway Honda. It was a tired old Honda motorcycle dealership with a tile floor that had very few tiles left in it. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a dozen motorcycles in a space that could probably hold 100, so you knew that there wasn't a whole lot of money going on at the place. A young couple had just bought the dealership from another individual that had it a long time and let it go to pot. And so there just wasn't a lot of money to fix it. And so I came in and was just kind of Mr. Sunshine and, you know, talking about stuff. People gave me a hard time for that. I was always Mr. Positive and <laughs> sometimes overly so. Sure. Uh, but the two of them decided to invest $500 with me. And it was co-op money that they had had for those who understand co-op advertising money. So it was mm -hmm. money that was that they uh, was was subsidized 50 percent by Honda. Right. And uh, so we ran the ads and lo and behold, they got some response. And so they decided to put more and more money into it. And so uh, I had I'd been a, a remote broadcast with them about a year later. And uh, we had it was at a bar, surprisingly, at a rock and roll station. We had a live broadcast at a bar. <laughs> and so they happened to come to the broadcast because it was nearby. And so I was just really happy to see them. Uh, and so we said, and so it's customary, of course, you buy your first customer a beer. Of course. And so at the bar, we're sitting, the three of us, and, uh, and uh, I asked them, I said, did you guys know that you were my very first customer? And they kind of looked at each other. And they said, yeah, we knew. <laughs> and I said, well, can I ask what caused you to want to buy from me? What what was it? I mean, what is it that that turned the corner for you to, to say yes? And so the husband looked at the wife and they said, "Should we tell him?" He said, "Yeah, let's tell him." He said, "We just enjoyed seeing you come in the door every day. Aww. That's what we bought. We, you know, it was a difficult time for us because we weren't sure whether we were going to make our next rent payment or not. But you were the ray of sunshine we could always count on that would really kind of cheer us up. Yeah. And so that's the reason they bought. It wasn't because of the station, because of the music, because of the audience. It was because I helped them feel better about being in business. And I literally broke down and cried right there in the bar. And it was... Uh, I mean, a very touching moment for me. And then I realized at that time what I was doing without even really knowing what I was doing. And I think it's to help others feel good about whatever it is you do and to be sincere about that. Uh, that's difficult to train. And as a sales trainer today, it's very difficult for me to tell that story and not have people really get it 100 percent. But I, I think for those who have been in business and understand it is that you have to be sincere about what you do, and you have to firmly believe in the product that you sell. The first person you've got to sell on the value of what you do is yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, and in, in, this may happen to you now, but I'm, 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 I, it probably happened more in your early days. Those moments when you're making a cold call, mm -hmm. and like suddenly you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach, and you know you. For whatever reason, don't want to go in and talk to, and talk for whatever you know. For if you're having a bad day or something's a little bit off, but um, those moments where you you just kind of feel a little bit un, unsure. How do you push past those moments um, to go and do that? Because I know obviously you know speaking cold calling is it can, is a is a, a diff difficult skill, um, and it can you can psych yourself out pretty easily. So how do you get past that? You know, that was hard at first because I wasn't really skilled at that and I didn't have anyone really behind me to say, here's what you should do. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's easy to say you should engage in positive.